Welcome. This is Circuit Talk. My name is Nitin Shah from Mitre Ingenuity, and today we're going to talk about full stack innovation, especially in the context of the CHIPS Act. Our guest today is Todd Homdahl. So, Todd, welcome. Um, uh, please, may I ask you just to introduce yourself, some of your background, please? Sure, yeah. Uh, thanks, Nitin. My name is Todd Homdahl. Uh, I've been working at uh, Microsoft. Uh, for almost 30 years now. I'm an electrical engineer and a software company, so that's got its good points and its uh, bad points. But uh, over that time, I've worked on everything from uh, Xbox. Uh, I started the Xbox hardware group to HoloLens to quantum computing and uh, and I just finished off with uh, running the hardware for the Azure systems group a few years ago, and, and now I'm really engaged on looking at strategic silicon and, and, and ensuring that you know we have a good continuity to, of supply here in the US, as well as a, a secure product, no matter where it's built. So Todd, that's a, a very wide ranging background, but very relevant to our conversation today in the context of the CHIPS Act and the challenges that we face, but also the opportunities here in the US. So. Um, as you know, semiconductors are core to any of the uh, products and services and entertainment, including Xbox, which you worked on as well. So um, could we just start with, what is your thought about the impact of semiconductors on the, the nation as a whole? It, it's It's been talked about a great deal, but your personal perspective on semiconductors and their relevance to our our country and our industry. Yeah, I mean the for me the semiconductor is kind of both the the brains and the heartbeat uh, of both our economy as well as our national security. If you look at all the products that are out there, whether it's a car, of course your computers, your phones, your TV sets, your now your appliances, they all have semiconductors in them. Um, they all uh, have you know, high performance semiconductors that do a lot of processing and connect you into the internet, uh, which allows you to have a, a better customer experience. It allows you to do more things and be more efficient. And then of course, for national security, you know, more and more you're, you're finding not only are semiconductors and the, the products that we use in national security, but a lot of them are tied to the cloud to process all the information that they get. And you know, when you get something in the cloud, you just need an incredible amount of processing capability. And, and then of course, uh, that's where semiconductors and silicon come into play. So I think it's um, you know, vital for the country. It's an existential threat uh, if we lose access to them uh, at any node. And that, you know, we need to do all that we possibly can to ensure we have a continuous supply and to ensure that we have a secure supply. I mean, it is one of those vectors that hackers will go after if we're not uh, careful with security. No, thanks for those observations. So regarding semiconductors, um, one of the topics that we want to cover today at the core of uh, semiconductors and innovation is this notion of full stack innovation. So, um, my understanding is that full stack innovation is perhaps not well understood by everybody, which is why we're talking today. And it seems to be an approach that results in the highest impact and the most innovative results. In other words, in order to achieve sustainable competitive advantage, we shouldn't only focus on one layer of the technology stack for uh, uh, computing or memory or other semiconductor products, but what we've described as the full stack so just wondering, um, the full stack, what is it? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. And for me, you know, when you look at a, a product, let's take the iPhone, it's, it's made up of a, a computing chip, a typically CPU and memory that's made out of materials like silicon and uh, other different substrate materials. And that's where a lot of the processing is. There's a, you know, there's a, a motherboard that it goes on that's made out of a different material and it connects all these pieces of semiconductor and other components together. There's a, an LCD, a display, which is made out of different materials that displays this information. 
you know, then there's a uh, an interface, you know, that you have to touch and, and use in order to um, input information into the device. And that that like when the first iPhone came out, that was a unique concept that was developed, particularly for that iPhone. And then there's the case, you know, it's uh, iPhones are um, well known for the amount of energy that they put into designing their case and the materials they use to make it slim and sturdy and reliable. And then when you then you move up what I would call the next level of the stack, and that's the hardware or the software. And in something like an iPhone, they completely did a new operating system for a, a different form factor of device. They did a new operating system for a different input paradigm, you know, when you have touch and things like that. And then the last part of it is the applications, you know, the application uh, construct is completely different. So full stack to me means you touch all the different points uh, on a on a product stack where you start with materials, you go to the compute devices like the semiconductors, to the materials that you make it, to the to the operating system, to the applications, and and you can see in that particular case, that was a revolutionary product, right? Because of the fact, I mean, you had a no one expected that type of device. We were all prior to that had these big PCs, or we had clunky um, devices that kind of look like a tiny PC, but you couldn't input into them and you couldn't look at anything because they were too small. And what Apple had done at that time was they were, they were really able to create a revolutionary product. And my thesis is that, that you know, we're running to the end of a lot of these different, like just focus on one layer of it. And that in order for us to have revolutionary products, think of a moonshot or the Manhattan Project, that you really need to touch every level of the stack. And that, that's what I'm calling a full stack innovation or, and a full stack solution that you, you have the ability to manipulate all these different variables in order to change the paradigm. So I think one, one of the things you, you mentioned several times is revolutionary. And I think you're tying the ability to do something truly innovative and revolutionary with full stack. So what's the counter example? In other words, if I limit a, a new design or a new innovation to just one or two layers of the stack, so to speak, then um, I, I'm surmising what you're saying is you, you limit yourself or your possibilities by not looking at the full stack. Is that the right way to look at yeah, it? Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, when you, I mean, I think the canonical example would be a CPU, right? They just, they make faster and faster CPUs. And so you, you can, you can go ahead and put a faster CPU into an, into a, an Apple type device or previous to that, a, a Blackberry type device, but unless you actually changed everything like the form factor and the input paradigm um, and the types of materials you're using, the operating system, you're going to end up only with a, a BlackBerry, which isn't really good at like taking a look at the internet, nor is it great at, as an input device for things that are non-typing. And so that to me was the revolutionary part of the iPhone. Uh, they were able, they touched the, the full stack. And if you're only just, if you're only just increasing your clock speed on your CPU, you're not gonna have, you're gonna get your applications to run a little faster, which is nice. You might be able to do a few different things, but you're not necessarily gonna be able to do something revolutionary. And that really changes the paradigm. So there's a, a kind of a historical perspective here. I recall uh, a, a lecture by professors uh, Hennessy and Patterson uh, in a Turin lecture a few years ago, and they reflected very much what you said, which is that um, in order to have big leaps in the area of computing and, and uh, or computer architectures, which is what those two professors worked on, um, they really had to look at every element of the stack, including, like you said, applications and software, and not just the hardware piece in order to achieve the extraordinary achievements that they had. So um, it, this is very resonant and maybe reminiscent of that discussion as well, which is if you want to make big, 
big breakthroughs, big challenges, then in order to achieve that, the full stack approach is the right approach. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a good parallel with quantum computing. I mean, it's a it's a different computing paradigm than a Turing machine, for example. And if you look at how uh, most people are building a, a quantum computer, you know, they don't use transistors anymore. They use some sort of qubit, some flavor of qubit. They don't typically run it at room temperature. They're running it below four Kelvin in order to yeah. like not get noise involved uh, with it. They the, the their operating system is completely different um, because the the computing paradigm is completely different. All the applications have to be rewritten in a way that takes advantage of you know this, the superposition of your qubits. And so that is a nice parallel to what Dr. Hennessy and, and said about you know these full stack solutions. And it's only by changing the complete st- stack you know different materials it's not going to be silicon plus it's going to be some semiconductor and right. some superconductor by changing the qubit not it's not a transistor by changing the system you're not in a at room temperature at four kelvin you're not running windows os on it you're running some crazy new operating system and your applications are, are completely different they have to take advantage of these uh, this ability to do superposition so i think that to me, that quantum computer is a revolutionary device. I mean, it's going to do things that the Turing machine, I mean, it's going to take it a billion years to crack some sort of encryption where a quantum computer can do it in a few days. So that those are the types of things that you know I want to aspire to and I want to inspire other people to get into this field that they see the types of things that we're trying to do. Yeah. So before talking more about the future, I also did want to talk a little bit about your past regarding the Xbox, which is very personal. So I think yeah. all of us have been entertained and, and amused by the Xbox. And I was just wondering, um, you know, the Xbox had many extraordinary capabilities. So uh, is that also another example of where you personally uh, pioneered sort of full stack because you have sensors, the input device, and and obviously all the computing and gaming capability as well. Yeah, no, I mean that that was a full stack solution as well. I mean, mm-hmm. you look at the the paradigm kind of before um, game machines, you know, PS one, PS two were out then, and, and Nintendo was out. But the paradigm before that was really about using a general purpose PC, right? With a with a you know something that's done for doing your Excel spreadsheet, as well as playing video games. And so you had a mouse and a keyboard as your input devices. And what you know what we were able to do with the Xbox is, is basically focus just exclusively on gaming solutions. So we didn't have any extra transistors to do a Excel computation. You know, we used a game controller instead of a, a mouse or a keyboard. The operating system, again, is not Windows. It's a completely rewritten operating system that allows you to, to process games uh, faster. You know, it's, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy machine on on GPU performance versus, you know, a standard one. You know, we spent a lot of time, I remember in early 2000s, debating whether or not to put Ethernet on it. And, and we did. And that that was really the the creation of Xbox Live. That was the first time you, you, you had kind of the start of this ability to play games uh, across the internet and online. And the, these, you would not have that if you're only changing one aspect of um, of the stack and so i, I think the xbox um, is a, is a great example of that and you know it's a it's a product we launched it first in 2001 we started in 1999 it's it's been you know it's, you know 21 years strong uh, yeah it's extraordinary so, uh, yeah. it's it's a good story but and a fun to be part of and yeah I, it's it's revolutionary in its own sense yeah. And, it, and it really, you can see the the real important thing is the customers like it. And we were able to generate something that the customers like by touching all these aspects of it. Got it. So actually, let me uh, bring this back to the Chips Act. Um, 
and semiconductors and the future. So um, one of the things that we've discussed is this notion of breakthrough challenges, meaning that uh, rather than focus future R&D in the United States on incremental uh, work, uh, we are at a point in time where we are um, looking at the CHIPS Act legislation, which allows us to look at things in a different perspective. So this tie between full stack innovation, breakthrough challenges, and looking a little bit to the future of semiconductors everywhere in different markets, different places, and so on. Just your observations on how we, we can really inspire the industry and academia, perhaps, to take on research development, prototyping projects, which really are going to turn into massive commercial successes. So your thoughts just in general yeah. of all those topics. No, I, uh, I'm a huge believer in these in these in this idea of breakthrough cha challenges. I, th I think it really forces you to think outside of the, the, the normal paradigms that are out there. Uh, and whether it be, you know, operating computers at a tenth of the energy they use today or, you know, looking at quantum computing or going after climate change or, you know, any of a number of uh, interesting solutions out there. I, I, I like the idea because it, again, it forces you to, to think differently about the product, to really stretch yourself. Um, it gives you some guidelines too. You're, you're not just doing business as usual, putting like research and into small different silos. And I think the beauty of these breakthrough challenges is it forces a bunch of us to collaborate really well together. And when you get all that collaboration and that horsepower, you, you can start really building off of one another's ideas. And you can and you can touch all these different parts of the stack. And if there's one area where you can't solve something, maybe you can actually go out there and solve that in another area of the stack. So I, I'm a huge believer in this because, you know, it, it kind of gives us some guardrails to go forward with. It gives us um, uh, it's aspirational. It will inspire people to come and work with us because they see this. Um, it helps us in the decision making process. Um, we're just not spreading the peanut butter across the number of different, you know, research yeah. groups. You know, we're, we have a goal in mind. It's easy to talk about somebody, what we're trying to do. And I, I just, and I, and I do think that we are running out of runway on today's technology with transistors. We're not, Moore's law is slowing down. And so we're going to have to look at other parts of the stack and other materials in order to continue to, to be the leader in the world in making products. I mean, there's no place close to the US in coming up with, with new innovative products. And this is an opportunity to continue to build on that. So your um, comments more on, the, on a human or personal level is this notion of collaboration. And uh, many people do talk about um, our, our competitive strength being, being, being collaboration, in other words, collaboration leads to very, very good forms of competition. And it's something that I think stems from not only the technology aspects, but really using these breakthrough challenges to allow different companies or different universities or different parts of our industry to really work together towards these goals. So you mentioned also moonshots earlier. So um, just a few thoughts more about people and maybe the next generation of innovators and, and students uh, listening in on this, because um, we've talked a lot about technology and products, but how about people? Yeah, no, I, I, I uh, am totally biased, but I think that uh, our engineers and our scientists are you know, existential to the country, that they drive a lot of the commerce, they drive a lot of what allows us to protect ourselves. These are very important things to consider going, going forward. And that, you know, we want to be able to show them what they can do with this, with math and science and engineering. We want them to be able to work with other like-minded people in order to create these, these innovative pro products. And I, and I think, um, you know, we don't do a very good job along the whole educational 
stack in letting people know what's possible, inspiring them, like giving them the tools to see what they can do with this information going forward. And I, I worry that we're really losing our competitive advantage as well. But other countries are much further invested in creating these next set of engineers and scientists and mathematicians than that. You know, we need to, to continue to push that. And one of our strengths has been and always will be with the way we run our country is this, this collaboration and this, this opportunity to work on new ideas. And we have you know, thousands of new ideas popping up all over the place and, and people vote with their feet to go and, and work on these things. And that, that is a, a great concept. And so I, I just think we need more of that. We need to enable that and we need more people that are capable of doing it. So Todd, that's very inspiring. And thank you so much for uh, being with us today here on Circuit Talk. And again, Todd Holmdell from Microsoft, with deep thanks, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. This is a great uh, effort and thank you for and MITRE for, for driving it. Mm -hmm.